So without further ado, I'm going to start with the first panelist, and that's Gregory Wrightstone, who is president of the CO2 Coalition. All right, thank, thank you, Anthony. I've got to, I'm, I'm height challenged, so I've put this down. Let's see. So we want to go next. So this will be uh, climate change in the Midwest. This is the third uh, uh, planned paper that we have on state and regional initiatives. The first two were on Pennsylvania. The second is on Virginia. This is on the Midwest. We, we're planning a whole series of these. Um, this series was started um, in early August of last year. Pat Michaels uh, was planned to be the lead author from this. He submitted an outline and a rough draft. and. Of course, he had the modeling part part way down. Uh, he came in the next week. Uh, we were supposed to flesh it out, and he said, "Greg, you know, I'm just not, let's do this next week. I'm not feeling very well." Uh, and he went home, and you know what happened. Uh, so, uh, well, this is a what you're going to see today is is my section of the paper on temperature and severe events. We hope to publish the final version here, uh, hopefully within the next month or so. Um, and we, what we did was took a look at the national fourth national climate assessment. Uh, this is the Midwest region that's shown here. And uh, basically it overlaps what's known as the corn belt and the soy belt. And again, we have that region outlined in red that we'll look at today. Um, and the fourth na national climate assessment, uh, in their overview, they listed some really bad things that were going on and predicted to go on. And in the regional uh, picture for the Midwest, they claimed that, uh, inc that we're seeing increasing high temperatures, uh, reduction of Midwest agricultural productivity, increasing rainfalls, uh, loss of life, uh, increased economic impacts, loss of habitat, uh, and existing and worsening, worsening health impacts. We'll, we'll look at a few of these. In 20 minutes, I can't look at everything, but. We'll look at some, a few of these. In the paper, we'll deal with each one of these and just show just how wrong the na fourth national climate assessment was. Uh, I, I have to say I've reviewed the fifth national climate assessment, and it's, it's as bad as the fourth, which was pretty awful. So we'll look at the Corn Belt summer temperatures here. Um, this, is, this is from NOAA's own data. This is Corn Belt summer temperature. It's not declining. It's actually been in slight decline since the 30s. And we compare that here to uh, carbon dioxide. Whenever you see blue on my charts, it's blue is carbon dioxide. Um, and this is from the uh, European Environmental Agency, uh, Trends in Atmospheric Concentration. I like this. There are a couple others you can use. But, but this goes back to the 1800s. Uh, and here's Corn Belt maximum temperatures, again, declining completely opposite of what the fourth national climate assessment uh, reported. And then I went back through and I said, okay, well, let's look at uh, record high temperatures by state. And these are the states, of course, that are in this Midwest region. And there was only one of these with, with a, um, a record high temperature after 1954. And that was South Dakota in 06. All of these other record high temperatures for the Midwest were set uh, mainly back in the in the 30s for the most part. Uh, so again, it flies in the face of their claim of record high temperatures and heat waves. Uh, their other claim is that agriculture productivity will be impacted greatly. And uh, again, I took a look here. What, what's actually going on with precipitation? This is Corn Belt precipitation that's increasing. And when we look at it and look at agriculture, the fourth natural climate assessment actually admits that, and, and also the IPCC admits that actually increasing rainfall is only really bad if you have horrific floods, and that increasing rainfall benefits greatly agricultural productivity. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Here I'm going on and on. Okay, I gave up the precipitation one. Okay, this is minimum temperature. I need to read my own slides better. Thank you. That's on me. So minimum temperatures have been increasing. Of course, that, uh, that, that bodes well for fewer frosts. Uh, and so, so we're seeing uh, uh, higher nighttime temperatures and higher winter temperatures. Um, and a lot of what you're going to look at here, Tony Heller's got a really cool new climate tool. 
Uh, I've, it took me a while, it takes a little while to figure it out. I've got a Word document. I've gone through, with Tony's help, uh, leading, I can, I can provide that to you uh, so you can also use these. Because if you look at Tony, he's fly in his YouTube tutorials, he says, well, this is simple, but he flies through at a mile a minute. And so what I've done, done is go back through and capture the, the flow uh, of, of this. And this temperature tool, uh, this is the output we have. And so this is summertime average maximum temperature. Uh, and you can see that I've, I've selected the, um, the, the states in the Midwest. Uh, and there's a lot of cool things you can do here. Uh, and what actually he does, he gives you the ability to get you get a JPEG that looks like this, but also you get a CSV file. You can turn into a, an Excel file and create your own uh, uh, temperature charts because I'm pretty particular with what I use. And these are the type of things you can get. You can get um, average minimum temperature, average maximum temperature, daily temperature. I mean, there's a whole litany of things here. Um, and, and what we see here, too, with Tony, with, with this, and as you know, Tony likes to expose... Uh, temperature adjustments and fabrication of data. Um, three main things, we have the urban heat island effect, uh, adjustments that have been made to historic temperatures, and we have fabricated data for stations that are no longer there. And uh, uh, of course, if we go back, uh, there are quite a few, I believe, Anthony, I believe there are 51%, there's a large percentage of stations that no longer exist. So they just make update and fabricate what, for what they think it should be. Um, the adjustments that are made, the majority of these are daily temperature readings that were taken either in the afternoon that are too hot or in the morning too cool. Uh, but the overall effect of this is to cool the older temperatures and warm the modern temperatures. So with this tool, you can actually look at the raw adjusted um, United States Historical Climate Network temperatures. So this is the raw data uh, for the Midwest, the states that we're looking at. And you can see that um, the average temperature has been declining since the, since the mid-30s. Um, so what does the adjusted NOAA temperature look like? I, I think you all kind of have an idea what that's going to look like. So, uh, so we've got, this is the NOAA adjusted temperatures for the Midwest. And, and that's, they, they've turned a, a slight reduction um, over many decades of temperature into a slight increase in temperature. Um, the other thing Tony has the ability to do with this, with this really cool, I think you guys, are, everybody in this room is going to love to use this once you figure it out. So I took a look, you can take the, the raw data less the adjusted data, and I did a 10-year rolling average here. Uh, going back to the 1920s. Um, and what we find here is up to the mid-90s, we had a, a reduction. The average temperature adjustment was a significant reduction in the adjusted temperature. And the modern data, the adjustments were all to heat it up. And that, boys and girls, is how you turn a temperature decline into a temperature increase. And it should anger you, it does me. Um, they were also claimed in the fourth national climate assessment for the Midwest, um, at risk communities were at risk of impacts such as flooding and drought. Well, is that really the case? And thank you, Ben. Now we're going to precipitation. Uh, but uh, Corn Belt precipitation has been increasing. And it's not leading to uh, increases in flooding. What it's doing is, is fueling this crop growth that we're seeing throughout America's breadbasket. Um, and the drought severity index, the, the PDSI, uh, again, we see an increase uh, in lessening of droughts. We saw really severe droughts, of course, back in the, in the 20s and 30s, uh, even into the 40s, severe droughts. And we're seeing, we still see periodic droughts, but... They're not as intense and not as long, and, and we should celebrate that. Um, so it's again, we're seeing once you're going to hear me say it a lot, completely opposite of what they're what they're telling us. Uh, even the fourth national climate assessment had to recognize the results, uh, and they they said that that there's a climate trend for agriculture, 
and providing, we're seeing the changes in precipitation and drought, is providing a favorable supply of moisture. And that's a good thing. Again, we should celebrate that. Uh, we look at Midwest agricultural productivity. Um, again, the fourth national climate assessment predicts, of course, that we're going to see a uh, lack of productivity from crops, that Midwest agricultural produ productivity are going to decline to the levels of the 1980s. Really? Is that the case? Let's take a look. Um, again, this comes from T Tony Heller's uh, work here. This is length of growing season in the Midwest. Uh, we see that, of course, with, with warming temperatures, killing frosts uh, end earlier in the spring and arrive later in the fall. So you can get more plantings in. Uh, you don't have to worry about your crops being killed off. Uh, if we look at corn productivity in the United States, uh, we see, now this, this, this chart here shows um, the grain yield in uh, 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 bushels per acre. And you can see starting in the 40s and 50s, we saw a great increase. Now, I've, I've compared this here with carbon uh, emissions. And again, this is from the European uh, uh, Agency with emissions of carbon dioxide. And, uh, and I know I saw Will Happer walk in. He, it's his pet, pet fee. He says, it's not carbon. It's carbon dioxide. So I've, I apologize, Will. Sorry about that. Um, but... Uh, so the carbon dioxide, but the, the fact of the matter is, and I know Pat Michaels, this was his big thing. Well, yeah, that was when he, he talked a lot about, that was his specialty, um, was uh, technology increase. And you'll hear Patrick Moore in a little bit talk about GMO. Uh, we started seeing all these things are combining. We also see David Legates will talk in just a few minutes about the beneficial use of nitrogen fertilizers. And about the time when we see crop growth that skyrocket, all of these things are combining at the same time to drive crop growth. Increasing CO2 means we've got more crop growth, the CO2, um, you know, CO2 coalition effect, the CO2 fertilization effect. We're seeing nitrogen being used starting about that time. We're seeing advances in technology, and we're also seeing... Uh, again, Patrick loves to talk about GMO. It's demonized, but uh, we, we see that we're leading these drought-resistant crops that have been developed, particularly VJ Jayaraj is in the other room talking right now, and he's talking over in the other room about GMO and drought-resistant crops in India because India has been plagued for thousands of years with, with drought and, and famine. Uh, we don't have as much of a problem there anymore because of this the uh, the, the GMO crops that are being used. So we've got a whole thing, a lot of things going on. But the good news is all of these things are driving increases in crop growth. And what do they want to do? They being the climate industrial complex. They want to shut down nitrogen fertilization, again, that Dave's going to kill crop growth. They want to slow down and kill CO2 fertilization effect that will shut down and slow crop growth. No, we should be celebrating the things that are increasing it. And, and again, celebrate that we're feeding uh, more people. Um, and here's, again, this is fertilizer. David will have one similar. Uh, the dotted line is nitrogen fertilizer versus crop growth. Uh, Midwest severe weather. Um, how am I doing on time, Anthony? Good? All right. So we've got F3, the most intense tornadoes. Uh, we see that are in decline. Uh, I want to thank Chris Martz, uh, who provided this data. Um, and this is really, this is significant. We had our team of experts um, in... Um, hurricane denier. Yeah, I'm a <laughs> hurricane denier. Amazingly, I, no one's ever looked at, this is all groundbreaking science here. Um, the rate of land falling hurricanes in the Midwest has been completely, it's been zero for 170 years. And we know every single one going back to 1850. Um, so uh, uh, Midwestern emission reduction effect on global temperature. Well, I went back and I looked at using the model for the assessment of greenhouse gas induced climate change. Again, this was something that uh, Pat Michaels didn't come up with it, but he put this together at the Cato Institute. They had it for many years there. Um, and I was able to capture all their data before they um, unfortunately took it off their website. Um, and so 
And if, in fact, if, you're, if you want to get this magic data, I've got it on a smartphone app that you can uh, access that. And, uh, but you can see here that actually for the Midwest, if we, this was, if we had reduced to zero all Midwestern carbon dioxide emissions in the year 2010, it would, it would have averted four hundredths of a degree Fahrenheit by the year 20, 2100. All of the Midwestern CO2 starting in the year 2010, four hundredths of a degree. And I got five minutes. Uh, and again, we took a look, uh, Chris Martz again, um, he, uh, his data, we're seeing the Florida land falling hurricane frequencies by decade. Um, I, I'm a victim of, of climate change, I guess, because my, my home in, over by Tampa, uh, we're going to get the roof re finally is going to be replaced next week, and because Hurricane Ian damaged the entire roof, and so it takes you what seven months to get it together. Uh, but but so but I and that's when I took a look at this land falling hurricanes, and I actually looked at every state in the Gulf Coast and the Eastern Seaboard, every single state had a decrease in land falling, except for Mississippi, had a decrease in land falling hurricanes. And since we're in Florida, I thought you'd enjoy this. Um, we hear about these terrible summer, you know, heat waves and extreme weather. Uh, here's Florida's average maximum summer temperature is actually less than it was in the 1950s. This was uh, unexpected for me. I'd kind of assumed that it would be in the 1930s, but uh, but this is this is uh, Florida maximum average summer temperature. Um, and as I'm wrapping up here, uh, I'm really proud of what we've got going with the CO2 Coalition with our CO2 Learning Center. Uh, we've got a group of, of 15 of uh, these PhD formed a committee. They were concerned about. Um, the state of science education in America. So we got these 15, I thought, you know, you get 15 PhDs, I thought they'd be a bunch of eggheads, they never get anything put together. And these, these PhDs, what they have done is amazing, uh, videos, we're gonna be launching this hopefully on Candace Owens next, next month. Uh, so we've got, we've got books, videos, and lesson plans we'll be launching. Um, and this is a caricature from our artist. You can see, you can recognize Will Happer there to the left of the guy at the desk, there's Will, and Patrick Moore is in front of the desk, and of course, um, I'm down front and center to the right. I do the voice of Mr. Fish. Um, so, uh, and the, you notice the, the, the fish has a silver mustache. And so, uh, um, I'd encourage you all, once we roll this out, we'd like you all to, to help us uh, promote this. I think it'll be, the homeschool community will love it. And so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you.